thank you everybody. I am Dr. Elaine McGough. I'm the Natural Environment Officer with Antashka. I have a PhD in freshwater ecology and an advanced diploma in planning and environmental law. And I work in the advocacy unit of Antashka. So we work on all aspects of planning and policy, trying to ensure robust protection for nature and water quality in, in any planning decisions and in any government policy. And I'm going to talk to you today about freshwater. Um, freshwater has come in all types and sizes. We have over 3,000 rivers in the country, over 12,000 lakes, and more than 1,400 kilometres of canal. As a wet country, we are rich in water bodies, so there are advantages to, to having this much rain. And we have lots of lovely water bodies to look at. Um, and our inland waterways support populations of threatened species in Europe, such as Atlantic salmon, white clawed crayfish, freshwater pearl mussel, and, um, and twait shad. And our aquatic systems and wetlands support internationally uh, significant populations of birds, fish, and invertebrates. So we have some, the, the, we have a lot of freshwaters and they support an awful lot of life. But it's not just the big uh, water bodies that count. We have a lot of smaller wetlands like ponds and wet fields, and these are just as important for wildlife and water quality, and they often get overlooked. So I want to give some specific mention to some of those here. So in Ireland, we're lucky enough to have turlocks. Turlocks are temporary lakes. They come and go. When the water level is high, like in the winter, you'll suddenly, you might overnight, a, a lake may appear in your field and it'll be gone almost just as suddenly, a couple of days later. Um, we have fens, like the incredible Pollardstown fen down here in Kildare, where I am. We have callows, like the Shannon callows. These are wet grasslands. So when the Shannon floods, you get these sort of lovely wet grasslands that are so important for species diversity. Uh, we have ponds. I'm sure you're all familiar with ponds. We also have things that a lot of people would overlook, like wet grassland, like here in the margins of fields where you have rushes growing. These are also incredibly important for, for wildlife and wet woodland. Now, um, these are all very important habitats. All of these, the big ones and the small ones, for providing habitat diversity and ecosystem services. But the problem is that wetlands in Ireland are generally viewed as wasted land, somewhere that needs to be drained and turned into useful, productive agricultural land in a lot of cases. So we're losing them rapidly. Over 50% of Ireland's amphibian wetlands have been lost to drainage, um, and to peat extraction, to pollution, natural senescence over the past 100 years. And um, they're also, when they're drained, they're also a significant source of carbon emissions. Um, and this is often as a result of unregulated and ongoing drainage of peaty and organic soils for the likes of agriculture and forestry. Rewetting of nutrient poor organic soils has proven benefits for carbon sequestration and biodiversity, along with flood alleviation. So, in essence, our wetlands are really important and it's vital that we protect and restore them. So, why are freshwaters important? Well, water is essential for wildlife, for all life to thrive. So amphibians like newts, frogs, toads use water as shelter and breeding grounds. Birds use waters to bathe and remove parasites. The picture of the bird here is a dipper. It lives um, around rivers, one of my favorite birds. Bats, um, this is a job engine's bat. They forage over waterways. And then at the smaller scale underwater, you clean water supports really rich invertebrate communities like insect communities like water beetles, dragonflies, mayflies, water boatmen, just to name a few. Um, along with all of the, the animals, there's also a huge array of different types of wetland plants that grow alongside waters. You have those that grow on the margins, you have uh, plants that grow completely submerged underwater, and you have those that float at the likes of pond lilies. So at a fundamental level, access to water is essential for life on Earth and for all living things. And there's a really incredibly complex ecosystem associated with our water bodies, and it supports a huge array of species, often species that you wouldn't even think of, like the hedgehog here. They depend really heavily on, on ponds and small water bodies. And water is also really important for well-being. Um, the presence of water is positively associated with human health, well-being and happiness. It has, uh, being around water has a psychologically restorative effect, and studies show that spending time in and around aquatic environments has consistently been shown to be even more beneficial than green space for inducing positive mood and reducing stress. And in Irish mythology, rivers and streams are often a boundary between this world and the next, and Ireland's rivers are steeped in tales about the Tuatha Dé Danann, the ancient Gaelic gods. 
and references to water are also deeply embedded in our culture, like in the famous Patrick Kavanagh poem, Oh, commemorate me where there is water. So what does a polluted water body look like? Well, obviously now that I've introduced you to all the loveliness, I'm going to talk about the bad news. I'm sorry, it has to be done. And um, to tell you how polluted Irish waters are. Now, a lot of people talk about the biodiversity and the climate crisis, but water quality is equally in crisis. It just doesn't have as much of a voice. The main pressure on water quality is increased nutrient pollution from phosphorus and nitrogen. And these are coming mainly from slurry, from fertilizer and from wastewater. But first things first, what does a polluted water body look like? How can you tell if a water body is polluted? Well, this first photo, any guesses? It's pretty polluted. That's really bad algal bloom. It looks awful. This here, rubbish floating around. Who of you would like to take a swim in there? I know I certainly wouldn't. Here, the dead fish, not a chance I'd be getting in that water. There's obviously something gone really wrong. So in these cases, it's easy to tell it's polluted. But then what about this river? the lovely Slaney, or this, the beautiful Noor. Looking at those, particularly the Noor photo, I'd find it so tempting to, to go for a swim or to paddleboard along that. But EPA data tells us that the Noor and the Slaney are some of the most heavily impacted rivers by nitrate pollution. But that's the problem with water quality. You often can't tell until, oh, sorry. You often can't tell until it gets really bad. That, that there's this pollution is happening. And what's, ha what's happening underneath the surface in these water bodies, it's what you don't see. So as the water gets more polluted, the more sensitive species die off. So the likes of your dragonflies and your mayflies or your salmon, and the ecosystem becomes much less complex, made up of much more tolerant fly larvae. So algae thrives in nutrient pollu polluted waters. It's as soon as you put nutrients in water, algae will jump to attention, they'll, they'll take over. Um, and as the algae grows, it uses up a lot of the oxygen in the water and fly larvae, good for them, don't need much oxygen. So they can live in really polluted water bodies. But fish species do and a lot of more, the sen more sensitive invertebrates do. And as you lose these species, you also lose what's called function. So each of these animals in the water has a job of sorts, for want of a better way to put it. So some of them feed by scraping algae off the rocks. Some will shred up the leaf litter that falls into the water bodies. Some predate pest species like mosquito larvae in the water. So when you start to lose these species that do these jobs, then the functioning of the ecosystem also breaks down. So the algae won't be scraped off the rocks or the leaf litter won't be being shredded. And it will just have knock-on impacts on the whole ecosystem. And the river slowly starts to die. And ultimately, you may end up with something resembling pea soup, like in the first photo I showed you, where the algae just takes over, blocks out all light from the rest of the water body. And there's no chance of anything much living in there besides fly larvae. But it's really hard in a lot of cases when the pollution is only moderate, it's really hard to identify those polluted waters without looking at what's living in it and doing some water chemistry analysis. And I think that's why this issue is got going largely unnoticed by the public because you look around at Irish water bodies and often they do look incredibly beautiful. But if you knew what was happening under the su surface, you'd have quite a different opinion. And just to give you an idea of what is happening at a nat national level under the surface, we're in trouble with a lot of our water bodies. Uh, the EPA data indicates that roughly half of our waters and lakes are ecologically unhealthy. And the latest data shows that nutrient concentrations are too high in a significant proportion of our water bodies and the trends are going in the wrong direction. Agriculture is the biggest pressure. pressure. It affects more than 50% of our water bodies, but it's not the only pressure. Wastewater treatment um, impacts on 29% of our water bodies. Uh, hydrological impacts and hydromorphological impacts, so basically when the physical structure of the river, the lake, is, is interfered with, that impacts on 24% of, of water bodies and forestry pressures impact on 16%. Now there's a lot of other pressures, but these are just the headline ones, which I'm gonna talk about today. And of significant concern is the finding that nitrate is increasing in nearly half of our river sites. And this is particularly apparent in rivers in the South and the Southeast of the country. So you can see in this image, this map, that all of the orange and red dots indicated elevated nitrogen. There's a really clear spatial pattern. You can see them clustered down there um, in the south and southeastern counties. And the EPA published a report in summer 2021, and it was one of their strongest statements yet 
highlighting their concerns about the impact of agriculture on water quality, particularly in the south and southeast area. And these are some of our most well-known rivers, the Three Sisters, the Barrow, the Nore, the Shore, with the Slaney, the Blackwater, the Bandon, the Lee and Cork. All of these rivers are name-checked name by the EPA as being under significant uh, pressure as a result of nitrogen pollution. And the pace of change is breathtaking. In the last 10 years, nitrogen concentrations have increased in nearly 90% of the river catchment sampled. Um, and the data shows that in these rural catchments, 85% of the nitrogen is from agriculture, so from slurry and fertilizers. So it's not so much an issue of wastewater treatment in these cases, in most of these cases. So why is this happening? And in particular, what's driving this increase in nitrates in the south and southeast? What's going on? Well, since 2010, there's been a 50% increase in dairy cows, and the majority of that increase has happened in Munster and Leinster. It is mostly happening there because that's where a lot of our best soil is, like free draining soil that is, is really good for, for growing, um, growing grass to maintain these, these herds. And synthetic fertilizer has increased in lockstep with this ramp up in the dairy cow numbers. It has increased by more than 34% in the same time period. A lot of this stemmed from the lifting of the dairy quota back in 2015, which up until then had kept a lid, I guess, on dairy expansion. And government policy, as soon as the dairy quota was lifted, government policy and advisors all encouraged farmers to go for it, like hammer and tongs, which is how we've ended up where we are today. Farmers did what they were advised to do. And this has resulted in serious ecological pressure. And you can see how out of step we are with our European colleagues in terms of a drastic increase in cow numbers. The majority of member states are reducing their cow numbers. And look, that's Ireland at the very end in green, towering above all the other member states. And around now, you should be asking yourself, why are we not addressing this problem? Or why is the Irish government not putting safeguards in place to prevent this agricultural pollution? Now, I don't want to go into all the detail, um, but in regard to the nitrate pollution issue, there is an EU directive called the Nitrates Directive. And its purpose, its sole purpose, is to protect water quality from agricultural runoff. And as part of that, every member state in Europe writes what's called a Nitrates Action Programme every four years, to say how they're going to achieve the aims of the nitrates directive. So it's a plan that says for the next four years, here is how we, we're going to stop agricultural pollution of fresh waters. Now, earlier this year, we adopted our fifth plan and the previous four have clearly failed. All you have to do is look at the EPA evidence to know, to know that. Um, and as these quotes from the environmental assessments that accompanied that latest plan that we've just signed off, uh, the environmental assessment clearly highlighted that economics is winning out over environmental protection. So the first quote, the adverse impact caused by the sector over the past 10 years is clearly evident. It's a clear admission that there is a problem. But then they go on to say there's a clear driver from the natural environment for change, which is recommended for implementation. But this change has not been adopted for economic reasons, a.k.a. the environment is, is in trouble, but money is more important. Why is that happening? Why, are, why is the government ignoring this environmental message? Why are they, they holding so strong to the economic um, interests? Well, a lot of you probably know this, but dairy is a great economic success story in Ireland. It's where most of the money is in farming. The average dairy farm income was uh, reported last year to be over 97,000 euro compared to just 10,000 euro for beef farmers. So that's a massive disparity. And it comes with a very strong lobby group that don't want to see the growth of the sector stop. And that's why we end up with contrasting headlines like this. We have Laura Burke, head of the EPA saying, we can't have this ongoing growth of the dairy sector. And then we have Charlie McConnell, Minister for Agriculture saying, dairy emissions plan should allow new interests and expansion. So a key point here, is that the government policy and agricultural advisors have facilitated this expansion. On foot of lo lobbying from the, from the industry leaders, farmers are just following the money. Um, and there's very high levels of indebtedness on dairy farms, and a lot of their loans are linked to the milk output on the farm. So it's a complex issue to solve. But from my perspective, it's obvious that the dairy herd has to be reduced for a multitude of environmental reasons. But the social aspect of that needs to be very carefully handled. We can't hang farmers out to dry for following government policy. 
But the issue is that so far we haven't even gotten as far as acknowledging that reality at government level and addressing the issue. Um, I think the reason is that addressing this issue will cost them votes. It's not going to solve itself, but as long as you have like headlines like that from the Minister for Agriculture, we're at nothing. So while the EPA is doing fantastic work demonstrating the pollution and highlighting the pressures, vested interests are then winning out and the necessary safeguards just aren't being put in place. And as one politician said to me when I talked to him about this issue, said people never tell me they care about water quality, which is so sad and so disheartening as somebody who advocates continuously for water, um, water protection. So essentially, uh, politicians aren't hearing about this from the, um, from the electorate. They don't believe there's any votes in it. They know that there's votes to be, um, to be had in supporting agriculture and dairy expansion. So without the public speaking up, then the vested interests are hearing out, are winning out. And moving on from agriculture, some more bad news, I'm afraid. It's going to keep going. Um, there are 33 towns and villages in Ireland where raw sewage is released into the environment every day because they're not connected to treatment plants. This should be a national source of embarrassment in this day and age. Raw sewage, like this is the type of thing you'd expect in, in a third world country. Um, this is compounded by malfunctioning infrastructure. So where, where there is a wastewater treatment plant in place, often they're malfunctioning, like this Rings End plant. I'm going to show you a lovely photo now just to really, you know, whet your appetite for your lunch. Um, this was a photo from the Rings End plant in the last year or two. Uh, it treats a huge percentage of Ireland's sewage because it, it um, services such a massive population in Dublin. And it's completely overwhelmed. It's, it, it needs to be upgraded. It can't handle the amount of sewage that's being directed towards it. And it ends up by times releasing raw sewage straight into Dublin Bay, just like you can see in this photo here. Half, as well as that, half of Ireland's urban wastewaters are still not treated to even basic EU standards. Like it is shocking how bad Ireland is when it comes to urban wastewater treatment. The EPA has identified 97 priority areas around the country where improvements are needed. And these range from like plants as big as a raised end plant down to um, smaller, uh, smaller wastewater, smaller towns and villages where wastewater is adversely affecting the local environment. Now, besides being utterly gross, um, this represents a significant threat to human and ecological health. And the EPA have called out Irish Water um, on the unacceptable delays in delivering this. And there are movements to improve this. In fairness, Irish Water acknowledge that there's a problem. They don't try and hide away from it, but they're too slow to address it. And there's a lack of transparency in what is going to happen and when. Um, Irish Water needs significant investment by the government if it's to comprehensively address this problem. And while I have I'm not a, a um, cheerleader for Irish water, but I do have to, to say that, you know, Irish water adopted really um, inferior infrastructure when they took, took, took over, to when they came to power in, in the position that they're in now. Um, and I think they're a useful fall guy because people, the public's attention then is often an anger is directed at Irish water, but actually it should be directed more at the Department of Housing because they are the ones who are in charge of funding Irish water. And there's only so much Irish water can do with the money that they're given. So this is, you know, lay the blame, Irish water are to blame, but it's also very much laid, laid the blame at the feet of the um, Department of Housing. And it's also worth noting that it's not just the big treatment plants that are a problem. Uh, private septic tanks are also a significant risk. Over half of the septic tanks um, failed in Ireland, failed inspection in 2020, those that were inspected, because they were not built or maintained properly and 23% of those systems were a risk to human health or to the environment. Now you can see in the right-hand photo that where you have you know, septic tanks um, malfunctioning, you might end up with blue-green algae in the water. And it looks, it's really unusual, you'll, you'll see it, you'll, you'll know it um, and spot that it's different from normal algae. When you see it, it almost looks like an oily film and it's incredibly toxic to animals. Like there's a lot of reports of, of dogs jumping into waters that have blue-green algae or cyanobacteria, it's also called. Uh, blue-green algae blooms and they die so it, it's a really this is it, we're not messing about here this is a really serious issue but we're told anecdotally that many people don't even know where their septic tank is let alone if it's functioning correctly 
So if you own a septic tank, here's my plea for today, please make sure it's doing what it should be doing and maintain it properly. And warning signs will be like ponding in the soak away area, like in the left hand picture here, and smells. They're sure fire signs it's malfunctioning. Um, but the best thing to do is have, have it emptied and desludged regularly, like every two to five years. And also, um, a lot of houses that are in septic tanks would depend on well water. Um, it's really worth checking the quality of your well water, because often if septic tanks are malfunctioning, they'll be contaminating your well water, um, along with potentially other land runoff. And even if your septic tank is functioning perfectly and you're absolutely confident, neighbouring septic tanks may also be. So um, speaking to a public health doctor, uh, I was told that a lot of wells aren't, um, they're not at the standard, the drinking water standard they should be at. So it's worth, it's worth doing a test on that and uh, checking to make sure your septic tank is doing what it's doing, doing what it's meant to be doing. Another major pressure on water quality is physical alteration of water bodies. So dredging of rivers, straightening of rivers, weirs, um, dams, that sort of thing. Now the um, OPW uh, is responsible for maintaining about 11 and a half thousand kilometers of channels in 33 catchments under the Arterial Drainage Act. Now the Arterial Drainage Act is an act that comes from the 40s. It was brought in to allow for the drainage of large swathes of wetland to convert it into productive agricultural land. And this law has a clause in there that obliges the OPW to um, dredge and maintain water bodies in the same state as what they were in when they first dredged it back in the 40s. So the original works would have involved straightening um, and deepening any water uh, courses to move water off the land as quickly as possible. You can see in the two photos on the right, these rivers are incredible. They, they just don't look very natural. They're very straight. There's not much going on in the riparian zone. Um, maintenance can be anything from cutting vegetation in the stream or on a bank, redredging them, um, going in with a digger, reaching in from the side with the digger, building up the banks again, or the removal of trees. In the bottom right-hand photo, you can see that they're after totally dismantling the riparian zone, the, the bank of the river on the left-hand side. Um, that would then, you know, it leaves all the silt exposed. So with a good heavy rainfall, all of that's going to wash into the river. So it's a vicious circle of maintaining the water bodies in an un unnaturally altered state. So be it overly straight or overly deepened. But the thing is what rivers, they constantly strive to reach equilibrium again. Like there's energy moving down through a river system and energy needs to find balance. So it will erode at high energy points. I like get, you know, bends in the river. It'll erode, erode away the bank and then it'll deposit at low energy points. And it'll naturally rebuild its own meanders and, and get back to its own natural point of equilibrium. And the vegetation that grows on the banks and in stream are essential for stabilizing that habitat and, and reaching that equilibrium. But what's happening with arterial drainage um, is the OPW will go in and they'll just feed this vicious circle. They'll keep these rivers in a permanently unstable condition and slowly uh, degrading rivers every time they come in to do this maintenance work. Like if they stopped doing what they were doing, the river would return to a more natural state. But then that would also mean that the, the um, water wouldn't move so quickly from the land and there's likely to be more. Uh, land flooding. Now there is questions about the legality legalities of these works in light of EU law and um, the OPW would say that they're obliged to carry out this work under national law but actually EU law trumps national law so if they're breaking the water framework directive or the habitats directive then they they're not allowed to do what the national law tells them to do. Um, there is an increase in focus on hydromorphology, I'm happy to say for a long time it was it went kind of unnoticed or maybe it was just too difficult to grapple with. Um, but people, uh, decision makers are starting to look more at hydromorphology. And when I say hydromorphology, I just mean the shape and the structures of water bodies. Um, and there is a review of the legislation going on. So there's, there's movement afoot. So hopefully we will get to a point where we see the Arterial Drainage Act revoked or amended, because as is, it's causing untold damage over 11 and a half thousand kilometers of Irish waterways. And also continuing to drain wetlands in the midst of a biodiversity and climate crisis is absolute madness. But as with all things, it's difficult as there are many landowners now farming on the drier land that has resulted from this and there would need to be compromises. So, I mean, there's never any easy solutions, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try and, and, and work out what to do. So 
on the whole, I would say that there's wide scale recognition among ecologists, not necessarily decision makers, but among ecologists, that rivers need to stay connected to their floodplains. It's a, an essential element um, that they're allowed to flood. And it's even more important going forward with more intense rainfall. We need to slow down the flow and hold it on the land where we can, not speed it up and just like speed the problem further downstream, where then they're going to have to deal with it again. You know, like the likes of Cork in Cork, where they're going to have to build huge flood walls through the city to try and stop Cork flooding. If that water could be held in the countryside much further upstream, it would be beneficial on a whole range of levels. Another key habitat we're losing is pristine water bodies. Now, these are the best of the best. These are the sort of water bodies you want to put on a postcard or you put in your tourism ads. We used to have over 500 of these in the 80s, and now we're down to just 20. So 500 to 20. It's a dramatic and ongoing decline over the last 30 years. And forestry is a major pressure on these, as they tend to be found in like uplands, because like, the reason that they are so unspoiled is that they're usually sort of out of the way in the uplands, you know, in the, in the hills of Kerry or in Cork. Um, forestry is a major pressure on these, and they tend uh, they tend to occur on peaty soils, and these are the type of places that would, you'd often find are under conifer plantations, often quail chip plantations. Um, these rivers are also where you find the elusive freshwater pearl mussel, which is in the picture here on the right. This is one of Ireland's rarest species. It's a bivalve, and it only le lives in the cleanest of clean rivers. They're incredibly long lived. In fact, freshwater pearl mussels are Ar Ireland's longest living species. They can live for up to 140 years. Um, and they use salmon. I love this. They use salmon as part of their breeding cycle. So they release their eggs and their eggs latch onto salmon gills and grow there for about a year until they drop off and go into the next stage of their growth. So there's very much a symbiotic relationship between, between salmon and freshwater pearl mussel. Um, Ireland is one of the last remaining strongholds for freshwater pearl mussel in Europe, but they are gravely endangered. We do still have populations, but one of the issues is that those populations aren't reproducing. They only reproduce when the conditions are good. So while we, you know, they live for 140 years, so the, the populations we have may hang around for a good while yet, but that doesn't mean they're healthy. Um, we need serious action to address the pressures on their pristine habitats, or we will lose this species for good. And there are, within Ireland, there are eight remaining strongholds. Um, the top, they're called the top eight freshwater pearl mussel catchments. And in a lot of those cases, what we need to do is to return their habitats to open peatland habitat. So freshwater pearl mussel are incredibly sensitive to fluctuations in water level. And when you have a river going through bog, an intact bog or peaty habitat, there isn't, there's quite a stable level of, um, of water all through the year. But then if you go and plant trees, and it doesn't matter if these are the most perfect like native trees, if you plant any sort of trees in their catchment, they evapotranspire, they like pull water up out of the system, put it up into the air, and it leads to fluctuations in the water level in the river. And that impacts hugely on the, the pearl mussel. They are incredibly sensitive. So what we need in those areas is to, to get rid of any forest free, quail or otherwise, and return them to open peatland habitats. And you'll be unsurprised to hear that that so far isn't happening. Right, I don't want to send you all off completely depressed on your lunchtime, so I decided I'd finish on a, a good news story, and that's ponds. Um, ponds, despite their small size, are incredibly important for biodiversity. So ponds have been shown to host more biodiversity than rivers and lakes. They support two thirds of all freshwater species. Now, they're ubiquitous, they occur everywhere. But the thing about them is they're really varied. So they provide a lot of habitat diversity, which in turn leads to species diversity. Like in one big field, you could have three or four ponds and they could all be entirely different to each other. They could all host totally different species to each other, but taken as a whole, that's incredible diversity. And the thing, like when you have multiple ponds, if one of them gets polluted, then you still have like other strongholds for the biodiversity to move into. Now, while we have been doing a great job of draining and wrecking the ponds that we have, the good news is that pond creation is one of the quickest ways to get clean, fresh water back into the countryside. So clean and healthy ponds can be quite quickly created. And I would often say the building a wildlife pond is the best thing you can do for wildlife. They're good for carbon sequestration. 
small ponds sequester 20 to 30 times the amount of carbon compared with woodlands, grasslands and other habitats. Um, and while river and lake pollution can be slow to turn around, I'm not advocating that we don't try, but even when there is political will, it will be slow to turn around. Um, ponds can, uh, they punch far above their weight. If you put ponds in a habitat, they will really quickly produce the results that you're looking for. So for example, I worked on a project in the UK, putting ponds into really intensive agricultural land. You know, the type of land where you wouldn't expect anything to be able to live much. And even in that very degraded habitat, those newly created ponds supported incredible levels of wildlife. It was really heartening to see. So while most policy and legislation turns a blind eye to ponds, they really are a fundamental tool, a fundamental key to reintroducing clean, properly clean water into our, um, in, back into our, our countryside. I mean, as I said, the pristine water bodies were down to just 20 of those, whereas ponds can be tiny little microcosms of that perfectly clean water. I mean, what's not to love? So what can you do? Build a pond. I'm all about po pond propaganda. Here's me and my pond. Here's me building my pond. A tiny little pond because I have a tiny little garden. Um, Antarctica has an EU life funded project on ponds at the moment. And we'll be bringing out some resources on pond creation. And we're currently promoting the establishment of ponds for local authorities. And we would love to get to the point where we have like a national pond plan in like akin to what we have with a pollinator plan and to have tidy towns and um, points awarded for pond creation. We, the project is still in its infancy, so we don't have those resources just yet. But in the meantime, for any information on ponds or pond creation, I'd recommend the resources offered by Freshwater Habitats Trust. Um, they're highly expert in pond creation. I work for those with them in the UK, and they have incredible information on the website. So any of you who are taking me at my word and are going to go digging in your garden this afternoon, um, have a look at, at the resources that they have. Um, in general, I mean, there's, it's... It's not that hard to make a clean water pond, but just, you know, the main things are don't fill it with tap water or river water, use rainwater, keep it very shallow. Don't be thinking about fish, like the, you'd be amazed that the most wildlife grows in just a few millimeters of water. And be, be, be really careful where you place it because you need to make sure that you're not going to have, you know, don't put it right beside your compost bin where you'll have nutrients um, flowing off into it. And then more widely, moving away from ponds, more widely from water as a whole, Talk to your politicians and tell them you care about water quality and demand they take action. And right now, there's actually an easy way to do that. The timing of this is good. The Sustainable Water Network, SWAN, currently have a campaign um, to improve the government plan for protecting water quality. So if you go to their website um, and take the actions outlined on their website, you'll find they have a list of asks and Antashka work a lot with SWAN. We absolutely endorse their asks. We fully support them. They know what they're talking about. So it's you can trust them that the asks that they have um, on their website are, are totally valid. Uh, support the work of environmental NGOs working on water quality like Antashka. And those of you who tuned in last week to listen to Porig, um, I would echo his call to put in a submission on the Citizens Assembly. And as Porig said himself, the Irish Wildlife Trust have some good gu guidance on doing that on their website. So check out their website, but use your voice, make your voice heard. Um, if you don't want to dig a pond in your own garden, try and take care of your local water body. Join community groups, call on your local authorities to look after your local water body. Because I think there's a certain amount of acceptance by society that urban, uh, urban rivers will be kind of rubbish, you know, that, they, that they'll that they smell, that they're um, canalized, you know, there's no, there's just not many features in there, that not much wildlife lives in there. It doesn't have to be like that. They can actually be really valuable habitats. They just need a little bit of management. Um, but to get that management, people need to care. And then also, Think carefully about what, what you put down your drains. Uh, avoid using chemicals in your garden. I guess the picture above shows the river and the sea start at your drains. Like you are part of the catchment, so you can be part of the solution. Um, and I'll just sign off with this. Please speak up for water bodies because they need our help. Um, I've been doing this for years and the message still isn't getting through. So the more voices we can add, speaking up for water body, the better. Thank you. Um, thanks so much, Elaine. Uh, so I, I'm going to open um, up the discussion portion now. There's a, already a lot of um, a lot of information in the chats. 
So for example, there are links to the Swan Take Action uh, campaign to restore our waters. And Mary Sinnott had a, and a very good um, suggestion, the All Ireland Pond Plan, which I think is amazing. It's a great one, one that I'd back. Um, a question from Mary Sinnott is, is there also information available on creating ponds without plastic liners? There is freshwater, again, freshwater habitats trust would have a lot of that information. Uh, it's trickier when you're not using liners because then you need quite heavy soil clay so that, you know, if you put it in in uh, soil that drains well, then you're not going to have any water there. So there is there is information and um, I think they even describe how you can dig a soak hole and do a bit of a test, like leave it for a couple of weeks, see if it holds water or not. But again, like they um, freshwater habitats for us to put in uh, like I don't thousands and thousands of ponds. They really know what they're doing. They've done them in all situations. They've done massive ones. They've done small ones. So have a look at their website. I, I imagine that any question you have will be answered by them. That's great. Thank you. And there are also some really helpful suggestions in the chat too. Um, the One Million Ponds Project, um, Kali Ennis and some local environmental groups who are doing pond workshops in urban gardens. Um, there's also a group in South Tipperary um, that have been working on ponds. Um, but next over to Natasha, who has her hand raised. Hi, hi, can you hear me now? Hi, yes. Yeah. Great. Um, so I, I have a, a two part question really. Well, first of all, could you comment on the new acres um, initiative, um, which is uh, the new cap and how uh, it might improve water quality if you see any of the initiatives there. And the second part of, uh, the second question I want is, um, like I know uh, we keep talking about policy and everything, and even when we get policy change, there is just so little implementation. So we actually have all the policy we need. Um, and, and maybe Elaine can comment on that. And uh, sorry, there is a third part, which is the rights of nature. Does Elaine know anything about giving the rights of nature, like making rivers an entity in their own right, a legal entity to help protect them? So sorry, I hope not to make <laughs> um, the first one is a quick answer on acres. Uh, I haven't had a chance to dig into it and see what, what it offers for water quality yet, so I can't answer that. Um, in the past, the a lot of the agri-environmental schemes haven't delivered for water quality because like one of them would be in high status waters, you just fence off the water body. In a lot of cases that that can help, but in, in other cases, you don't, it, it doesn't have that much of a of an impact. Like there's there's better ways to tailor solutions. So I don't imagine that they have nailed it in the new acres program but i i can't stay definitely because i haven't dug into it yet to know to know what they're doing um in terms of us having enough policy we do have good policy we do have good law you're right we're terrible implementing it and with water one of the major things is uh, policy cohesion so no one really takes ownership of water you know you've the local authorities who do a certain certain bits opw do other bits Inland Fisheries Ireland, the NPWS, everyone's doing a little bit. But like if we get a phone call about something happening to water and, you know, it's really hard to get anybody to do anything or anybody to go, oh, yes, that's my job. I should be doing something. So part of what we would be advocating for is a like a, a secretariat, somebody in charge, like a governing body in charge of water governance. And they make sure that everybody else, all the other bodies are doing what they're meant to be doing. And they kind of keep their eye on the ball to make sure that we are moving in the right direction. We don't have that, but we're really hoping we're pushing, they're in the middle of drafting the next, what's called the River Basin Management Plan, which is where for the next six years, they're going to say how they're going to achieve good, good water status. So we're lobbying hard for that in, in the next River Basin Management Plan. And your final question, oh yeah, rights for nature. I am more, I've looked at this, but it's more um, rights to a safe environment. So I guess more um, human focused. Uh, in terms of having that put into the constitution, I think it would be an incredible, va incredibly valuable thing. Um, it it was nearly the we nearly had it in I think it was the Fingal Airport case where there was the unenumerated right to a safe environment, but the Supreme Court then said no, that's a constitutional issue. So we'd very much need a referendum to get to that point. And again, that's one of Antashka's recommendations to the Citizens Assembly that such a referendum take place to insert the the right to to a safe environment. Now the rights for nature themselves, I know 
I think it was just last week in Spain, a lake maybe got uh, got standing to take a legal case. I haven't looked at that much. I'm, um, I'd need to read up on it. So I can't, it seems like it's a good idea. Uh, I would, yeah, I'd need to read up on it a bit. I mean, it makes sense, I guess. NGOs have, have standing to take legal cases. So why shouldn't, shouldn't water bodies or, or certain habitats? But um, I haven't read enough to be able to comment comprehensively on it. Um, thanks, Elaine. And there are some uh, good comments coming in uh, in the chat. So from Thalem, a good number of the EIP projects look specifically at ponds, silt traps, riparian buffer zones, still a minority interest in the Department of Agriculture, but a step in the right direction. Um, another suggestion of using of creating a small wildlife pond really easily using a household storage container that they just sunk in the ground. Um, one point from Una, which is a question, um, I absolutely agree with everything that's been said, but if I was talking to a farmer or landowner, how could I persuade them not to drain or afforest the land? From a financial perspective, it would be hard to convince them otherwise, wouldn't it? Absolutely. And that's, yeah, yeah, that's the problem that we're facing. So, you know, we have, we have all of these things that, um, are happening on our land that aren't necessarily beneficial for ecology. But for farmers, for landowners to change, then they're going to be, in a lot of cases, penalized, like up to, it's changing now, but to date under, under the cap, um, cap payments, if you had wetland on your, like ponds on your land, if you had overly large hedgerows, you'd actually lose money. So you've had like incentives, perverse incentives for farmers to drain their land and to cut their hedgerows and to kind of take away any space for nature to maximize the amount of money that they get. Um, the new cap looks like it might, that might be changing. So that is a good thing that farmers will, at least they'll no longer be penalized for it. But like when you're looking at something like dairy land, it's very good quality land. There's a lot of money to be made in dairy. So in order to persuade a farmer that's making a lot of money from a piece of land to let that go back to nature or to leave it as wetland, like economically, it's going to be a, it's going to be a tough argument to make. Um, but I do think there's a shift. I think the, there's an awful lot of farmers and landowners out there who actually do love nature and who who don't want to like be the villain of the piece, who don't want to be draining their wetlands. They want to, they want wildlife on their land. They grew up seeing those wildlife and they're for generations their family have. So I think we just need to have the proper incentives in place. Like I think as an individual going to try and persuade your, your local farmer, if they're in, you know, if they're on the bread line, essentially, it's going to be a hard argument to make. So I think money incentives will, will very much ease the way. But the problem is that that conversation still isn't really happening at a national level. Like I think, you know, in my eyes, it's it's really clear that we can't keep going the way that we're going. The, our farming system is broken. Um, it's, you know, leading to massive GHG emissions, biodiversity loss, water quality impacts. Um, but then what happens, what do you do instead? What happens to all those farmers who have bought into the system? What happens to all the farmers who've invested heavily in it? Like we need to figure out a way to get them out of it while trans um, offering a, a just transition for farmers. That's going to be really tricky. We need a very robust um, discussion about it with everybody at the table. And so far that's just not happening. That was a very long winded answer, but I hope it answered your question sort of. <laughs> Thanks, Elaine. Um, another point in the chat from Rebecca O'Flynn, no cohesiveness is a problem across all government departments and local authorities. No one is ever fully accountable for anything, which makes it more difficult than it needs to be. Um, and then a question from D. O'Shea, do we need a referendum to deal with addressing the Arterial Drainage Act too? No, that would be a referendum because it's not in the constitution, that it'd just be legislative change, so it'd have to come from the government themselves. Thanks, Elaine. Um, a suggestion uh, to see a great movie called Invisible Hand about protecting water, rivers, and rights of nature from Natasha. And a question from Janine, would it be possible to create a pond in a small enclosed urban garden? I think yes, Elaine, but- 
Absolutely, yeah. And there's, um, I mean, as I think you read out another comment there, you can make ponds in just like little buckets and little basins. So you can have tiny, even the tiniest little wetland wetland pond will be beneficial. So have it, Google it. There's a lot of stuff online. But yeah, don't like, you know, even if you have a tiny little courtyard, you can still have a little bit of space for nature. So see, have a Google, see what you can do. But there's definitely, there's definitely space for little mini ponds in your garden. Um, and there's a question here. Do individual landowners have automatic rights to do what they want in terms of drainage? And if the Arterial Drainage Act were revoked, would it stop farmers from draining too? Um, there's a second part to this question. Um, how about campaigning for licensed ownership and use of heavy machinery? Every farmer seems to own their own digger and is able to just um, sit up on it and do whatever they want. Um, in terms of landowners being able to do what they want, there's um, over a certain size, and I can't remember the number off the top of my head, you'd need planning permission for draining a wetland. Um, small scale draining can happen unregulated and mostly does happen unregulated. Um, I think, how do you address it? I like a lot of different things. There's, there's not great enforcement. So again, we get a lot of reports of drainage and of, you know, landowners messing or ran, random people messing with the rivers and the local authority are very slow to take action. Um, so I think it comes back to having one body who are actually accountable for water quality and they would then be able to improve, improve enforcement and improve um, you know, the guidelines for, for landowners so they know what they're allowed to do, what they're not allowed to do, and have people like, I don't know, the equivalent of an NPWS ranger who could go out and and intervene if somebody is doing something that, that they're not meant to be doing, because they may not be aware that they're damaging. They might think they're doing the best thing. You know, so I think there's a, a piece there for enforcement, and there's also a piece around education. Again, it comes back to Irish people, you know, like I think an old view that wetlands are waste wastelands like I think we need an education piece so people value the land that they have and they can see they can see the land as like I see the land like how valuable those wet corners are um and in terms of uh, machinery I'm not going to comment on that about whether farmers should be allowed to use the machinery or not because that would that's just um a whole can of worms so I'll I'll, I'll resist answering that one um, thanks, Lane. So a question uh, from Jamie Rohu. Uh, why do farmers not pay for the pollution they cause? And conversely, why aren't they rewarded for the nature they harbour? Yeah, they aren't paid. For, they don't have to pay for the pollution they cause because we don't um, we don't really have a polluter pays system in place. And there I would say that there's quite a lot of. Um, denial seems like a strong word, but there's a lack of people accepting responsibility for the impact of what they're doing. So, and that comes from like the top level, like the Department of Agriculture. I've had a lot of robust interaction with them and Chagas where they would be saying, no, agriculture isn't really, isn't really causing a problem. So until you acknowledge the problem um, and you acknowledge the cause, then there's no way to, to kind of recoup or to, to enforce penalties. Um, but farmers should absolutely be paid for uh, protecting wildlife on their land. There should be you know, we need to we need a new vision for for land ownership and land where um, things like fresh water, clean fresh water, and space for nature are valued and are paid. So farmers aren't forced to to clear the land and make the wrong ecological decisions purely so they can feed their family. We need to make it viable to be a nature farmer. Um, thanks, Elaine. So um, I've got one more question from Jamie, which I'll come to in a moment. But uh, could you comment on the benefits or otherwise of tree planting along riparian zones? And that's from Dermot Macquarie. Yeah. And again, it's that's a bit of a um, case by case issue in some places where you have like heavy soil, like in the west of Ireland, you have clay soil. Um, you might have a lot of silt and phosphorus running over the top of the land. And there, if you put loads of trees in place, I can really slow that down, stop it flowing into the rivers. It can be incredibly helpful. Now, there's other places where it might be at the top of a hill. So no water is going to flow through it anyway. So you can plant all the trees you like, but it's not actually going to have any benefit for water quality. So the EPA have done incredible work on this. They've um, put together 
pollution impact potential maps, PIP maps. And they will show you, you can open up, uh, it's a GIS layer, um, and you can look at it and it'll show you kind of color zones, where is vulnerable to, to phosphorus runoff, where is vulnerable to nitrate phosphorus, uh, uh, to nitrate runoff. And you could use those. I mean, they're at quite a large scale. So ideally you'd want more kind of ground truthing, but you could use those uh, to target the measures in the right place. So we have all the data, but that's that's still not happening. Um, and also just to flag up that in some cases, planting trees isn't a good thing. Like in the example I gave of the freshwater pearl mussel catchments, because I know the forest service uh, came up with a plan saying that they were going to, to plant riparian zones with trees, with native trees. Um, and the freshwater pearl mussel specialists in Ireland like nearly lost their mind because they said, if you do that, you're going to kill off all of the freshwater pearl mussels. So, you know, just be a word of caution to that. It's although it seems though trees seem like a good idea. There are times when planting trees isn't that good an idea, depending. Thanks, Elaine. And one more question from Jamie Rohu. What's the EU doing about pollution in Irish fresh water? Are there any court cases ongoing? Um, there is a court, there isn't any court action taken by the EU against Ireland for that. We have now since come out with a, an abstraction bill, uh, which is appalling and it actually is, is um, in contravention of it's meant to be it's, you're putting it in place to kind of to fulfill the requirements of the water framework directive but the bill itself is actually in contravention of the water framework directive so um, as with a lot of things it's really incredibly frustrating so that's the only uh, um, outstanding infringement on water quality terms but as i said there is a potential national legal case on water quality and um, there's a suggestion here for from Jamie Rojo, a quote, nature farmer, a new job, um, I think. <laughs> and uh, another uh, quest, another point from uh, Rebecca O'Flynn, regenerative farming can work really well, but from a par farming perspective, we need to consider how we value food, how cheap should it be versus quality, and also the role the multiples play in farming activities, which I think is some really excellent food for thought. It is, yeah. um, one question from Mary Sinnott. In terms of defining environmental protection, it is a moving target. How can we approach setting expectations around that? Would it be to move towards healthy targets for water quality and biodiversity and to have a specific minimum land usage surface area that's only for biodiversity? In terms of water quality, it's really quite cut and dry for rivers and lakes because we have the Water Framework Directive and it says you need to reach good status, good ecological status by 2027. And there was like, I don't know how many meetings they had at a very early level at an EU stage to figure out what does good ecological status look like. There's lots of metrics, but they're common to to all member states. So Ireland doesn't actually have a say. It's we like it's, you know, predetermined at an EU level. What good water status looks like so it, it isn't really a moving target so much it's just you know i think you know ecologically speaking we know what clean water looks like and that's what we're trying to get to thanks elaine i think those were all the questions that came through um through the chat and through um uh, people raising hands so um i'd like to again thank uh, dr elaine mcgoff uh, for your expertise and thank all of you for taking the time to join us this lunchtime. Sorry about the septic talk <laughs> if you were eating a sandwich, um, but it, it really can't be helped when we're, when we're talking about water quality in, um, and, and what, what needs to be done uh, to restore water quality um, in Ireland. Um, I hope you'll be able to join us next Wednesday. I'm going to put a link in the chat to the, uh, to the registration um, in, in case you, you haven't done that yet, uh, we'll be listening to Jim Lawler of the Native Woodlands Trust talk about native woodlands and how important um, that habitat is for biodiversity in Ireland. Again, I would um, welcome you everyone to join a SWAN's campaign to restore our waters, also to get in touch with your, um, with your politicians and let them know that you care about water quality. 
Um, let's all build a pond. I think that's an amazing <laughs> goal for everyone. Yes, please. Um, I have the smallest garden in the world. So if I could do it, I'm pretty sure look, most people can as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, and finally, uh, please do um, make a submission to the Citizens Assembly if you haven't done so already. Um, there are they're accepting uh, recommendations or you know our our views until the end of November. So let's let's show um, and and those recommendations will be made to government um, and can form an important part of point of reference and hopefully can can change legislation and policy going forward. Uh, but but please let's um, get involved locally and and at a national level. Um, thanks so much, Elaine, and thanks to everyone. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and hope to see you next Wednesday afternoon.